There is nothing more tantalising to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. Azores Underwater Pyramid Discovery The first one we are going to look at is the Azores Underwater Pyramid Discovery. Pyramids have been built nearly everywhere in the world, with an eerie similarity and mystery already existing for those above ground, those below ground are even more thought-provoking. The discovery was made right off the islands of São Miguel and Terceira in the Azores. Diocleciano Silva, the man said to have discovered this, was on a fishing trip and using the ship's bathymetric equipment. He saw what appeared to be a perfectly geometric structure, making him question what exactly he was floating above. He noticed that the structure was a perfect pyramid. It's amazing because it forms a perfect pyramid. Moreover, orientation, deployment of the pyramid, the vertices are oriented north and south, just north and south, such as Giza pyramids in Egypt, Silver told the Portuguese news website Terra. The pyramid is very obviously not a natural formation. The pyramid's age is supposedly 12,000 to 20,000 years old, dating all the way back to the last ice age, but little research has been put into the pyramid itself. Interestingly, the Portuguese Navy has dismissed the pyramid as a seamount based on old sonar readings in the area. No investigative team has actually gone to the site to check what this occurrence is truly all about. One of the admirals of the Navy, Admiral Fernando Perez, commander of the maritime zone of Zores, says there is not enough information about the pyramid to say what it really might be. He says that at the time, the probes would be a danger to navigation and find nothing. Perez also says that the Navy is not ruling out the fact that this entire structure could have been caused by a volcanic eruption, making it a regular underwater land structure. However, no such research has been conducted and further probes have been shut down. There are no civilizations local or even remotely nearby the area that were traditionally pyramid-building societies. Archaeologists that did have the opportunity to excavate the area found an epigraph from Roman times. Carthaginian sanctuaries, cave art and megalithic structures. Due to governmental decisions, and the Navy's overall skirting of the issue, it's probably a good idea for researchers to accept their answer of this simply being a volcanic underwater structure. Google AI learns to keep secrets from humans Robots learning to communicate in secret codes that we cannot understand is a frightening concept, one that many would say is the start of a potential robot uprising or end-of-world-themed movie. What is more frightening, however, is that companies are actively encouraging these secret, whispering robots. This is a somewhat terrifying concept, though inarguably a huge breakthrough in cryptography, and with a rather impressive experiment at that. Until this 2016 experiment, AI was not deemed successful with cryptography. Researchers with Google Brain told two smart computers to speak to one another in secret, have each other know what they are saying, while keeping the message hidden from a third smart computer in a paper entitled Learning to Protect Communications with Adversarial Neural Cryptography. The AI, named Alice, Bob and Eve, were assigned these various roles. Alice had the original text, or the secret. She had to encrypt it, make it appear as nonsense, and send it to Bob to understand and read, all without letting Eve in on the secret. Eve was aiming to recreate Alice's message with as few errors, as closely as she could. Alice was not given any set encryption method to use, simply assigned the task. The AI were partially successful to begin with. Bob and Alice figured out the encryption and could communicate clearly with one another through the shared key, though Eve was puzzling it out along the way too. After 10,000 attempts, Bob and Alice were able to thwart Eve's efforts at cracking the cipher, and by 15,000, she was no longer proficient in cracking the code. 
Bob and Alice were able to share encrypted information with one another through odd, unexpected techniques, certainly not techniques that would have been human-generated. Researchers have deemed the key to these AI neural networks maintaining their secret is placing a great deal of value on security. These robots prove that someday AI will be able to communicate and function in a way that hides information not only from one another, but from us humans too. The Picatrix Even though many mysterious books have originated from the West, just as many magical books have come from the East, this was such with a book called The Picatrix, which is a 10th century 400-page book all about magic and astrology. The original Arabic translation of the title is The Goal of the Wise, or The Aim of the Sage. The supposed author was named Maslama al-Majriti, who was an Arab Muslim astronomer, chemist, mathematician, economist and scholar in Islamic Spain. When he was not excelling in multiple disciplines, he spent time compiling together lore from earlier texts. Together in total, he claimed to have used the information from over 200 books over a six-year period. Although he wrote the original text in Arabic, it was translated into Spanish by the court of Alfonso X of Castile in the 13th century, and then later into Latin. Inside the pages, many astrological magic, potions, spells, philosophical passages, and even electoral rules are contained. Talismans, amulets, and images are used to emphasize many of the points made. And even though the book is heavy on the magic, it stored many useful elements that would influence a great deal of culture. Even after all this time, the book still influences a direct part of what remains dominant in popular culture today. There's a part that emphasizes actualizing the will through hidden or occult forces as a major theme, otherwise recognized today as the art of manifestation. Whatever you desire shall come about. Whatever he seeks from the Lord with whom he interacts, he will obtain. They requested their desires and fulfilled them. Those phrases from various translations come directly from the text and repeatedly emphasize the need for the user to have faith and trust the process. But everything in this book isn't always for the good. While early spells are for rather innocent purposes, like making two people fall in love with each other, later in the book it shows how to destroy an enemy. Everything in the book is also underscored by the author repeatedly swearing the reader to secrecy. Could these magic spells and practices be more powerful than we might realize? Regardless of whether you adamantly believe in magic, science, or both, the Picatrix has made a significant impact on culture throughout the Renaissance era. Perhaps it might make an even greater impact in the future. For now, it's just an unexplained mystery. Sir Victor Goddard and the Time Slip The skies are a wondrous place, and ever since man evolved, we've dreamt of being able to fly. Of course, this is now possible, and thanks to the technological advancements in aircraft, being able to fly has meant that human eyes have seen things that we should not necessarily have seen. If you've ever been to Scotland, you'll know that its impressive landscapes and sprawling greenery can be extremely relaxing and very picturesque to fly over. But for one man in 1935, his routine flight over the Highlands became a little strange. Wing Commander Victor Goddard was conducting a routine aerial inspection of a disused World War I Air Force base at Drem near East Lothian. The base, which was dilapidated and had not been used for years, appeared to be being used as a farm. A day or two later, Goddard flew back towards his own base. It was a grey and rainy Monday, with low visibility and high winds, completely the wrong conditions for a pleasant flight, as you can imagine. He attempted to navigate towards Drem, but couldn't work out where to fly, given the conditions. Suddenly, Goddard lost complete control of his plane. It plummeted towards Earth through the thick grey cloud, which offered no brakes. As he reached 200 feet, he was certain it was over. But it wasn't. Goddard reported seeing swirling water and a stony beach and was flying near 150 miles an hour. Drem's hangars appeared as a silhouette in the bleakness of the afternoon 
and as he approached the airfield, the skies brightened completely. As he flew nearer, he noticed a distinct difference in Drem's appearance. The airfield was freshly tarmacked, the hangars restored, and four bright yellow aircraft sat on the stand. One model of aircraft he didn't recognize, a monoplane of a new variation with RAF markings. Strangely, in 1935, the RAF had no monoplanes, not even for training purposes. There were men working on the ground, wearing light blue overalls, which was also strange as the mechanics that Goddard was used to seeing normally wore tan grey. Nobody seemed to notice Goddard's plane flying low over the airfield, and as he pulled his joystick backwards and powered back into the skies, the grey skies and Ray returned. Soon he was near his intended destination and landed, dazed. Goddard tried to comprehend what he'd seen, but simply couldn't. His colleagues thought he was either drunk or mad, and he stopped telling his story. However, four years later, the airbase at Drem would be refurbished. The RAF uniforms would change to light blue, and a new training monoplane, painted bright yellow, arrived on the tarmac at Drem. As time went by, Victor Goddard came to the startling conclusion that he'd, in fact, travelled through time. The Discovery of Previously Unseen Stonehenge Carvings Prehistoric cave painting is well known to be one of the earliest forms of art seen on Earth. Before language existed, let alone the ability to write, read or speak in the way we can today, man would tell stories through drawings. These paintings have been popularized in film, comics, literature and more. They've inspired modern storytelling as well as various fables and mythology over the centuries. Stonehenge, however, wasn't believed to have such extensive carvings, which, if researchers have got the purpose for its construction right, was a bit strange. But we live in the 21st century, and luckily the beauty of laser technology exists. People were reporting that they could make out carvings on the surface of some of Stonehenge's stones as early as the 1950s. However, these claims were often disputed as, well, the carvings were so hard to see that they could hardly be categorized as intentional drawings. In 2003, however, a group of scientists took to the stones with laser technology. The quality of the photos was naturally much better than the grainy photos from nearly 50 years earlier, and even though the stones had undergone a fair amount of natural erosion, scientists could clearly make out some carvings. Further studies of the images did not only show what the carvings were meant to be, but even provided some answers to the question of why Stonehenge was built. The prehistoric carvings seemed to be of axe heads, axes themselves, and even daggers. These may seem a little violent, but it was common for drawings of weapons, amongst other things, to be carved on the walls of burial chambers or religious grounds. Burial sites all over the UK display carvings such as these, but the commemoration of the deceased isn't the only theory that the carvings support. Some researchers believed that Stonehenge was designed to line up with the summer solstice, thus acting as a rather large calendar. These carvings may have pointed out specific dates, but this theory, to this day, is far from being proven. John Darwin's Disappearance Unlike other disappearances on this list, this one is quite possibly the most dastardly. John Darwin's disappearance, however, was one of manipulation, greed, and the desire to profit off a tragedy. John Darwin and his wife Anne were deeply indebted after purchasing two properties, the mortgage from one of these being £130,000. Mr. Darwin created an elaborate plan to fix the married couple's financial troubles that, in his eyes, was absolutely flawless. He planned to fake his own death, and his wife, Anne, was going to help. In March 2002, John Darwin went out on his kayak. He was reported missing the same day when he failed to come to work. A huge sea search took place to find him, as the sea is generally a tremendously dangerous place, and if someone goes missing at an aquatic scene, it is best to search for them immediately. Every second wasted is a second in which a victim could pass away. No body or trace of him was found, and the following day the wreckage of Darwin's kayak was discovered. The rescuers were puzzled, if not somewhat suspicious, as the sea had been calm the day he'd gone missing, 
and it seemed unlikely that anything could have happened to him on the waves. Still, John Darwin was presumed lost at sea and eventually pronounced deceased. The couple faked his death from 2002 to 2007. During this time, Darwin resided in a bedsit flat next door to their family home, only to secretly move back in with Anne in 2003. Anne was granted £250,000 after his passing as part of his life insurance, which paid off their mortgages. In 2004, the couple decided they should move abroad, considering Cyprus. Darwin managed to obtain a passport under the name John Jones, yet he used his real address. From 2004 to 2007, John Darwin was travelling from Cyprus to Kansas to Newcastle and Cornwall using his fake passport, interchanging between the alias John Jones and John Williams. Anne and John chose Panama as the next place to live and flew out to see some properties. During this time, a photograph of them was taken and posted on the internet by a Panamanian property agent. They proceeded to buy an apartment for £50,000 under the name of their son, Mark. Anne returned to sell their home in the UK and John remained in Panama. In May 2007, they bought a tropical estate in Escobar, Cologne, worth £200,000. They returned to Panama in July of the same year and stayed there for six weeks. It was only in September of 2007 that Anne's work colleague became wary of the situation after she overheard a phone call Anne was having with John. Their home was sold for £295,000 in October and afterwards Anne returned to Panama, ready to begin their new life together. This is until they realised that their identities would have to be confirmed by the UK police in order to live in Panama, and they plotted to have John fake amnesia over the past five years. He went to a police station in London, except between Anne selling their house and buying properties abroad and her colleagues tipped to the police, they didn't buy the story. A police investigation had already been ongoing for months without their knowledge. They were both sentenced to six years in prison for fraud and forced to repay everything they took from the life insurance, cost of their sold home and other fines and costs. To have a loved one go missing is an awful experience, and to think some people would take advantage of such tragedies in order to gain a profit is awful. Missing people's cases are never simple or easy to comprehend, and it's dreadful to consider all those who are currently out there, lost, abandoned, or deceased, without any hope of ever being found. We can merely hope that most cases of missing people will, eventually, be solved. Peter Jackson Missing at the Yosemite National Park In 2016, an elderly man in his late 70s was reported as missing at the Yosemite National Park in California. Jackson was reported as missing in September, but his body was only found in May of the following year. His car was left at the White Wolf Campground. It is speculated that Peter Jackson was following the mist trail in Yosemite Valley when he went missing. Jackson sent his son a text message on the 17th of September confirming his location, saying he was nearly at the National Park. Peter Jackson, despite his advanced age, was said to have been in idyllic shape and health. Jackson was by no means an inexperienced hiker and, according to his son, would go for serious hikes averaging to up to five miles each on a regular basis which just goes to show that anything can occur in the wilderness and even the most seasoned of adventurers and hikers can find themselves as victims of a cruel fate. Investigators and those involved with the search for Jackson claim that he most likely left the White Wolf campsite for a simple hike when he disappeared, but due to unfortunate circumstances, he ended up becoming lost in the wild. His camping fees were paid all the way through to the 21st of September, implying that his stay at the Yosemite National Park was supposed to be a prolonged one. According to some experienced hikers who commented on the case on Reddit, the White Wolf campsite lies on top of the Tuolumne River close to an incredibly broad canyon, with a single way down to the floor of the valley. You can easily end up falling from the side and become trapped midway down and getting out alone would be a near impossible task to accomplish. 
The camping site of White Wolf is what hikers generally refer to as leave-me-alone campsites, as these are for hikers who wish to be left to their own devices. Many hikers claim that this area is not a place to go by yourself. Experienced hikers such as Jackson himself ought to have known this, and so the reason why he chose to go there alone is unknown. Online speculators believe that Peter Jackson might have fallen into the crevice and twisted or broken his ankle and was unable to call for help due to either losing or breaking his cell phone or having no signal. Yelling would also be ineffective as national parks are vast and you are alone with nature. Unfortunately, his case was put on hold during those crucial days when he could have been found alive due to a lack of clues and bad weather. Michelle Whitaker Known by friends and family simply as Shelley, Michelle Whitaker went missing in August of 2002. Michelle was a waitress and had been arrested twice for drink driving in South Carolina but was later released. Her arrests caused tension between her family and her, especially complicating her relationship with her mother. She was last seen trying to get a ride from a truck stop in Spartanburg. In 2005, an anonymous letter made its way to the police, stating that Michelle had been brutally attacked and that her body had been taken to Landrum. This, however, remained unconfirmed throughout the duration of the case. Jonathan Vick was a potential suspect for the attack and taking the life of both Michelle and Heather Sellers, his girlfriend. In 2006, he was also charged for taking the life of Dana Satterfield back in 1995. Jonathan Vick is also a suspect for taking the life of two other unsolved attacks, which led to the victims losing their lives. However, his involvement with Michelle was only ever speculated and never confirmed. Michelle continued to be a missing person after his arrest and the case went cold for years afterwards. The police checked her credit card and social security number reports often with no luck. A miracle occurred in 2008 when Michelle was found alive and living in Oregon. One of her neighbors recognized her picture on a missing persons database and contacted the South Carolina police. An emotional reunion ensued between Michelle and her family, who had begun to give up hope of ever seeing her again. She explained that her old life was too troubled, as she needed to get away and begin her life again. Melanie Melanson Disappearance While hikers assume an inherent risk by entering uninhabited wilds, sometimes people can disappear into the wilderness much closer to home, never to be seen again. Melanie Melanson was a 14-year-old in Woburn, Massachusetts, who attended a high school party in the woods outside of town with about a dozen other older boys on a brisk fall night in October 1989. The kids were drinking and partying until the early hours of the morning, when it dwindled to just Melanie and two other boys, Jean Bertini and Jimmy Tresca. Jimmy wanted to return home and offered Melanie a ride to her friend's house where she would be spending the night, but she declined in order to spend more time with Jean. Melanie and Jean left the woods and walked back towards the town together, where Jean had parked his motorcycle. He only had one helmet and so did not offer Melanie a ride home, and reported that as he drove away, he saw her walking the opposite direction of her friend's house back towards the woods. However, as he was under the influence, he did not think to stop and ask what she was doing and if she needed any help. Melanie was never seen again. Unfortunately, Melanie's parents were known substance abusers and Melanie frequently ran away to escape from them. So when she did not return home that night and for several nights after, investigators assumed that she might have run away towards Florida and lost valuable search days as they waited for her to return. As the days passed and she did not return, investigators theorized that the outcome of that night took a much more sinister turn. The current theory is that Melanie was killed in the woods and that her body was moved several times after. Jean and Jimmy both tell conflicting stories of the night that Melanie went missing, and Jimmy's car was mysteriously missing and reported stolen the week after the incident. Search dogs trained for human remains alerted officers at several different locations in the woods, 
close to where the party was, but no human remains were ever found when the area was excavated, which led investigators to conclude that Melanie had indeed been buried or hidden around the area and possibly moved multiple times before her body was eventually removed by whoever killed her. Many believe that it was Jimmy and Jean who killed her and then worked together to hide the body, although the evidence against them is mainly based on rumour and gossip. Aside from their conflicting accounts of the events, it was widely reported that Jean had been cheating on his girlfriend with Melanie, and both Jean and Jimmy's girlfriends have refused for years to speak to investigators about what happened that night, despite both being in attendance. Jimmy's stepfather was a police officer in Woburn, and shortly after the incident, retired and moved the entire family to Florida. Jean went on to live a life filled with violence and was most notably arrested after pistol whipping and robbing two teenagers at a gas station and then refusing DNA testing in a case that went all the way to the Massachusetts Supreme Court. However, neither of the boys were ever convicted and it is likely that we may never find out what happened to Melanie on that fateful and tragic night in the woods. Those who choose to brave the wilderness of national parks, mountain ranges, or even seemingly innocuous outdoor trail hikes are frequently at the mercy of nature's whims, even if they do not realize it. The Missing Prime Minister On the 17th of December 1967, Prime Minister of Australia Harold Holt disappeared into the waters near Port C, Victoria. Widely believed to be merely a swimming accident, various theories began to pile up. This is most likely because Holt's body was never recovered from the waters. Holt became Prime Minister in January 1966. Holt initially denied having security, deeming it unnecessary and making him seem impersonal to the public. This changed later, after a window of his office was sniped out and a later assassination attempt was made on the leader of the opposition. He finally agreed to one bodyguard but never took one on any vacations. Speaking of vacations, Holt was an avid outdoorsman. He had a fondness for spearfishing and would fish year-round. He also snorkelled, preferring the freedom versus the cumbersome weight of a tank. He is described as having incredible powers of endurance underwater. That being the case, however, Holt still had two near misses in the water, one which he blamed on a leaking snorkel and one he blamed on chasing a fish while spearfishing. The morning of his disappearance began normally. Holt awoke early in his vacation house in Portsea, called his wife and stopped at a general store. The items he purchased did not seem out of character. Insect repellent, peanuts and some newspapers. Holt spent the morning with friends, with a notable stop in Port Phillip Bay to catch a glimpse of a solo circumnavigator coming through. On the way home, in typical Holt fashion, he suggested they all stop for a swim at Cheviot Beach. His reasonings were the hot day and wanting to work up an appetite for the barbecue lunch they had planned to enjoy. Holt was familiar with the area, having spent lots of time swimming and fishing in the area. He had even once retrieved a porthole from a shipwreck in the area. Holt was the only one to venture deep into the water. Others deemed it unsafe due to a visible swell and undertow. Holt swam deeper out into the ocean, despite the calls from his friends, and without a wave or call for help, Holt simply slipped beneath the water. The search for Holt's body went on until January 5, 1968. A formal investigation deemed it an accidental drowning, stating Holt took a risk that day and paid the price for it. They found no evidence to prove otherwise. They went on further to explain that if sea creatures had gotten a hold of his body, he would have been reduced to bones within days. This would explain the lack of body being found. It all sounds so cut and dry, but soon enough, theories began to surface. Some theories claim he ended his life, fearing his political career was ending. The police report specifically ruled out this theory. However, as Holt carried on his ordinary routines, his wife went on to say that she believed him too selfish to commit suicide. Other more crazy ideas involve a Chinese submarine rescuing their lifelong spy and being killed by a Vietnamese nerve agent, all of which have been marked as nonsense from Holt's family. In Australia, Holt's death is often the subject of dark humour. It has impacted their slang. Instead of bolting, one would do a Harold Holt. His death has even inspired a storyline on an Australian soap opera. Whatever locals believe, 
it is obvious Holt's disappearance has impacted the lives of those he served. The Disappearance of Erin Marie Gilbert Unfortunately, not all who get lost are found. This was the case with Erin Marie Gilbert, a 24-year-old girl who disappeared after leaving a first date on July 1, 1995. Erin, who would now be about 49 years old, was 5 foot 5, 145 pounds, with brown hair and hazel eyes. It was her sister Stephanie who first reported that Erin had gone missing after a night out on what was supposed to be a date at the Girdwood Forest Fair. Erin had moved from San Francisco, where she lived with her father, to Alaska, where she stayed with her sister Stephanie and her husband and two children. By the time that she went missing, she had been living with them for about a year. The night of Erin Marie Gilbert's disappearance, she was picked up by a young man by the name of David Combs, a man whom she'd met at a bar just a few nights before. When he came to pick her up, he was wearing sunglasses, a detail that Stephanie later recalled when speaking to officers and reporters. Before the two of them left, Stephanie's older son, who was four years old, suggested that his aunt Erin take a cell phone with her. However, Erin decided not to and left with David Combs. Erin and her date drove an hour to the Girdwood Forest Fair. Witnesses recalled seeing them at a beer garden until around 6pm when they left together. David Combs, who was later interrogated about Erin's disappearance, told the rest of the story, that when the two walked to his car, it turned out that it was not starting. He left Erin with the car, telling her he would walk to a friend's house to find help. After two hours of walking, however, he did not find the house and returned to his car alone with Erin gone. David Combs told authorities that he thought she had just gone back to the fair. When he tried the car this time, it worked, and he then decided to go back and search for Erin until around 1am. However, he did not call Stephanie about it until 7am, which was odd. Although Stephanie said that she would not have heard if Erin had come home at all due to the nature of the house, she checked her bedroom and found there was no evidence of her having returned. Police and investigators continued to search for her, as did the family. They went back to the fair to search for her, but nothing was found. Now, over two decades later, there is still no new information regarding Erin Marie Gilbert's disappearance. Although the family is no longer convinced that she may still be alive, they are still searching for answers. The Disappearance of Jared Negret Jared Negret was a 13-year-old Boy Scout who has not been seen since July 19, 1991, when he was separated from his troop of climbers in the San Bernardino National Forest. Tragically, the expedition was Negret's first overnight backpacking trip with the Boy Scouts. As an inexperienced climber, and described as being slightly overweight, climbing to the summit of the 11,500-foot mountain was a tough task. Negret grew tired at about 1,000 feet from the top, and was told to remain behind while the others completed the hike. However, when the troop returned, Negret was nowhere to be seen. The troop leader immediately led the five other scouts back to the base camp and then hiked about five miles in the dark to get help. A massive search was launched, consisting of San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputies and rescue teams from as far away as Sierra Madre and San Damas. They searched the 130-square-mile area of San Gorgonio Wilderness and on the third day focused their search on a six-square-mile area where one of Negret's footprints was discovered. In this area, searchers also uncovered beef jerky and candy wrappers they believed to have belonged to Negret. The most interesting discovery, though, was Negret's camera. On the camera, there were 12 snapshots. All but one were landscape shots. However, the final image was a close-up self-portrait of Jared, showing only his nose and eyes. The photograph had been taken using flash photography, and Negret appeared terrified in the image. Some have even claimed to see a pair of eyes behind Negret, as if he was using the camera to scare off a threat. It is believed that Negret lost his life by succumbing to the elements or by suffering a fall down the mountain. But over 30 years later, there are no traces of remains of the boy and Negret's final moments remain unanswered. The 
the unexplained disappearance of Larry Jeffrey. On May 28, 1966, a young six-year-old boy named Larry Jeffrey vanished from the Humboldt Toyabi National Forest in Nevada. He was wandering with his brothers near the peak of Mount Charleston, just a quick drive from Las Vegas at a 12,000-foot elevation. He happened to wander off from his family and was never found. Investigators say that there were no predators or cars around to take him, so he essentially just walked off, never to be seen again. After his family reported him missing to the authorities, they organized a full search and rescue with nearly a thousand volunteers. Even the National Guard assembled to assist in the search for the boy. They spent 16 days looking for him, managing to catch his trail a few times, but ultimately came up empty-handed. They discovered that he had eaten insects and berries along his walk, but could never actually find him. Searchers were surprised that they even found signs of his existence and foraging since he was wearing light clothing when he went missing. They had believed he would not survive through the cold night wearing such little protection from the elements, but he managed to last for a few days before his trail went cold. Larry was partially deaf too, which could have played some role in his disappearance. Perhaps he wandered off from his two stepbrothers and could not hear them calling for him in the woods. He was never found despite hundreds of volunteers searching up and down the mountain for weeks. The McCullough Disappearance Charles McCullough was 19 in 1974 when he left his home state of Virginia to travel to Oregon for a hiking adventure. Charles, or Chuck as he was affectionately known, had seen some friends before planning a trip to Crater Lake National Park in Oregon for a few days of walking amongst the stunning snowy mountains, beautiful sunsets and sunrises, and the crystal blue waters of the lake itself. Charles was a keen photographer, and despite weather conditions in the park tending to be poor in January, the month of his trip, Charles ventured on alone into the wilderness. Crater Lake National Park is covered in deep snow during the winter months. The park is still open and visitors can take guided snowshoe tours and even ski in the mountains. However, the conditions can be extreme, and travelling alone is not recommended. Not to mention that Crater Lake is actually the deepest lake in America at a massive 594 meters deep at its deepest point. Charles told his friends that he would be gone for around two days before returning to their house for the remainder of his trip. However, he did tell them that, if he was not back by the 1st of February, to call the police and report him missing. This would turn out to be a valuable piece of information. The days passed and the 1st of February was drawing nearer with no sign of Charles returning. The day swiftly came and his friends began to worry, calling the police and reporting him missing. The authorities powered through the worsening conditions, but to no avail. A mass search team found no evidence of Charles, with some assuming that he had changed his direction and that they might be looking in the wrong place. However, with nearly two and a half meters of snow, the search was not getting any easier, and despite the park thawing out as spring drew near, neither Charles nor his body were anywhere to be seen. There had been reports of people spotting Charles in the Diamond Lake area, a 45-minute car ride from Crater Lake, and a park ranger reported that he had given Charles a lift to the entrance of the National Park on the 30th of January. What had happened after he dropped Charles off, however, the ranger did not know. Nearly a year-long search showed nothing, until in 1976, two friends from Texas stumbled across chilling human remains after taking a wrong turn on their hike. The remains were confirmed to be those of Charles, but they were scattered strangely, with a lot of the bones still inside Charles's clothes. The weirdest thing, however, was that the remains were found 12 miles from where the park ranger had dropped Charles off on the 30th of January. How had he travelled so far in such awful conditions? The skull that was recovered showed no blunt trauma, and investigators concluded that Charles had frozen to death after removing his clothes in what scientists call paradoxical undressing, feeling hot when you are freezing cold. 
Charles's family did not accept the explanation and were sure that foul play had occurred somewhere along the line. After all, why were the remains in such a secluded place? Charles's brother wrote in 2016, if only those broken off shin bones could have talked to us, what do you think they'd say? I bet they'd say something like this. I hitched a ride with this creepy guy who stole my camera equipment and money and shot me in the head. Then, on a clear day in the dead of winter, he hauled my body into the remotest part of Crater Lake, took my shirt and boots off, and set me up on a log and left, figuring the animals would destroy the evidence by spring. The Unsolved Disappearance of Bessie and Glenn Hyde On November 18, 1928, Bessie and Glenn Hyde set out for their extended honeymoon where they planned to float down the rapids of the Colorado and Green Rivers for a few weeks. They said goodbye to Ellsworth and Emery Kolb, two brothers that were also spending time in the area. The couple departed on their boat to begin their exciting adventure, but they were never seen again. It has been nearly 100 years since the Hyde's embarked on their honeymoon and mysteriously vanished. Colorado River guides still tell ghost stories about the couple's disappearance when sitting around campfires because no one knows what happened to them. Although they were on an adventure honeymoon, it didn't take long for their family to notice that something was wrong and then soon contacted the authorities. Glenn's father launched a search on December 6th. They were not even considered overdue at their final destination in Needles, California, but his father somehow knew that something was wrong. On December 19th, their flat-bottomed boat was abandoned and discovered floating in the river by a search plane. It was discovered about three weeks after their initial disappearance and was located around River Mile Marker 226. The boat was in perfect working order, with no signs of destruction or overturning. There were also no clues signalling what could have happened to the couple. Interestingly enough, the hide's gear and supplies were still found aboard the boat, securely strapped in and undisturbed. Authorities even found a camera on board with their last picture taken around River Mile 165 around November 27th. Search teams and investigators had trouble with this case because there were no signs of disturbance, technical difficulties, violence or tracks leading away from the river. It was as if the couple simply vanished into thin air. Bessie did make a note in her journal, though, that they cleared River Mile 231, leading many to believe that they had at least made it past Mile 226, Diamond Creek, where they set up camp for a night. Additionally, Glenn was an experienced boatsman, having spent years operating and handling river rafts before their trip. He was considered an expert boat builder and managed their raft entirely on his own. He spent much of his life aboard rafts on the Snake and Salmon Rivers in Idaho. Although he was not a professional captain or entirely familiar with the surrounding area, he was not an amateur at risk of making simple yet fatal mistakes. The leading theory for their disappearance was that the journal was self-sabotage because the couple felt massive amounts of pressure from their friends and family. They intended to set a record for the speed and duration of their boat trip through the Grand Canyon, plus Bessie would become the first woman to boat the entire way through successfully. This pressure to do well and succeed could have caused them to either make mistakes or purposefully fail themselves. However, authorities found no evidence on the boat or surrounding areas to support and prove this theory. One historian believes that they were most likely swept overboard when their boat hit one of the many submerged rocks in the rapids that lie near mile 232. The granite rocks often capsize and damage ships, causing many accidents every year. The Hyde's boat, however, shows no sign of distress or damage from stones. In 1971, an older woman was sitting with a group of rafters in the Grand Canyon and announced she was the long-lost Bessie Hyde, having escaped the canyon after taking the life of her abusive husband, Glenn. After authorities contacted her, though, she recanted the statement and denied ever having said it. Famed river rafter Georgie Clark was speculated to be Bessie after she passed away in 1992, and authorities found some documents like Bessie and Glenn's marriage certificate in her possession. 
There were even skeletal remains discovered in 1976 that people assumed were Glenn's. However, it was proven by the University of Arizona to be a different man. There have been strange stories and theories surrounding the couple ever since they first vanished in the late 1920s. Their story has inspired many writers and artists, spawning novels, a musical, and even an episode on Unsolved Mysteries. To this day, no one knows what happened to the Hydes, and we most likely never will. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.